Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased that you have joined us today, and I would like to welcome you to our special webcast, NASA's Senior Issues Committee Presents, Behavioral Research and IA Systems and Solutions. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and that the views expressed by speakers and panelists on this webcast are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of NASA, their agencies, or organizations unless specifically so stated. If your jurisdiction permits, you'll be able to self-file um, for continuing education credits for this webcast. We'll show a verification code on the screen at some point during the presentation. You will need to enter this verification code into the appropriate spot on NASA Learning to receive your certificate of attendance. You will find all the CE information that you need in the continuing education tab on NASA Learning. Also, we would like for this webcast to be as interactive as possible. We'll use the Q&A feature on Zoom today to ask questions. Remember, when asking a question, please avoid mentioning specific firms or disclosing confidential information. Now it's my pleasure to welcome NASA President Andrew Hartnett to the screen. Thank you, James. And thank you to everyone who is joining us today. As James mentioned, I'm Andrew Hartnett president of the North American Securities Administrators Association and the first deputy commissioner in the Iowa Insurance Division. I want to welcome you to this webinar. At NASA, our members' priority is protecting investors. Today's discussion continues our years-long effort to focus on the financial exploitation of older Americans. That work happens across the NASA membership and is the focus of NASA's Senior Issues Committee, and the Investor Education Section's Senior Outreach Project Group. I know they, along with the NASA members in every jurisdiction, are constantly evaluating new ideas and approaches to find useful solutions to be implemented by regulators, industry, and by investors and their families. In addition to the work of the committee, we are lucky enough to benefit from the experiences and input provided by members of the Senior Committee's Advisory Council. The Council is made up of over 20 experts who are committed to fighting financial exploitation, and they come from federal and state agencies, self-regulatory organizations, industry, academia, and others. We know that the effort here transcends any one agency or organization's reach or ability. In other words, we recognize the importance of collaboration in the fight against the scourge of financial exploitation. That is what brings us together today. Now with other webinars, I would end my opening remarks here and turn the program over to Rich, but today is a special day. This webinar coincides with the upcoming five-year anniversary of the enactment of the Federal Senior Safe Act. This critical piece of legislation came about in large part because of the hard work state regulators are doing every day to protect senior investors. The act addresses barriers financial professionals may face in reporting suspected senior financial exploitation or abuse to authorities. This is an important and valuable tool that regulators, APS, and law enforcement can use to make sure scam artists are not taking advantage of people. So who better to discuss this piece of legislation than a state regulator who is closely involved in its development. And so I'm pleased to welcome Maine Securities Administrator, a past president of NASA, and a past chair of NASA's Seniors Committee, my friend, Judy Shaw, to the webinar. Thank Judy, you. welcome. As you know well, the Federal Senior Safe Act encourages training for employees of financial services firms to recognize signs of financial exploitation, and provides protections from federal privacy laws when those trained employees report their suspicions to authorities. Now, you were instrumental in getting this law passed. What, what led you to pursuing introduction of the bill? Two words, my mom. Uh, when I learned from um, that an alert branch manager at my mother's credit union had identified that my mother had been scammed, it occurred to me that maybe other financial professionals could be trained to be just as alert. And so from there, the Senior Safe Training in Maine was born. 
the training was rolled out in 2014, but even with the training, we knew that there was another barrier identified by the banks and credit unions, that they were very concerned that federal laws would prevent them from actually making reports of suspected elder financial exploitation to APS and law enforcement and even state regulators. So it seemed like the next logical step was to enlist Senator Susan Collins in Maine to help us break down that barrier. Yeah, I, I love your uh, your optimism. A lot of people might not say that uh, you know going to Congress is the next logical step, but in this case, it was a great one. So you know, getting a bill introduced is one thing. You know, getting it to the president's desk quite another. Share with us how that happened and the strategy that led to your success. Yeah, um, you know, we knew that we had identified a problem and we were grateful that the banks and credit unions in Maine were willing to put that problem um, at our doorstep. And I knew that by working with NASA leadership and NASA policy and government affairs team that we could absolutely craft a solution. You can craft solutions, but can you get them across the goal line? Um, I also knew that if we could craft a solution, Senator Collins would be willing to put a bill forward um, again, through the efforts of Mike Canning and um, then Director of Policy and Government Affairs and his team and others at NASA, um, we were able to gain some goodwill throughout all sectors of the financial services industry. We were careful to listen to their concerns, to be respectful, consider their ideas, and make sure that our solution responded in a way that would support what really was a mutual goal of protecting older investors who, as we all know, are so often um, targeted by scam artists, family members, and unscrupulous financial professionals. So the NASA team just did draft after draft after draft and shopped the drafts around to the key stakeholders. It took a long time, a lot of effort, um, but Senator Collins and Representative Cinema brought it across the goal line for us. And I have to say, personally, it's one of the most amazing experiences I've had in my professional career. And just the most incredible team effort. Yeah, I, I love what you highlighted there about um, everybody in, in this area, really everybody's goal is the same, right? We, nobody wants older Americans to be taken advantage of. Um, so anyone you know who has paid attention to the issue of financial exploitation of older investors uh, knows that you've been a tireless advocate in the fight to protect investors. Mm -hmm. What is your advice on where we should be concentrating our efforts now? You know, the world has changed a lot. Um, thanks for asking this question. Uh, one of the things that struck me was the recent advisory by the U.S. Surgeon General on the epidemic of loneliness and social isolation. And I think that advisory has just reinforced the need to focus on and find ways to combat social isolation. Social isolation, as I'm sure you know, is a key factor in predicting vulnerability for financial exploitation. Um, and that actually was confirmed in a 2022 longitudinal study by the Keck School of Medicine at USC. But what was interesting about the Surgeon General's advisory is that we're seeing that loneliness and social isolation is no longer a problem just for older investors. It cuts across generations. One of the fastest growing uh, cohorts of individuals who are, find themselves victims to romance scams is the younger generations, the 20-somethings. Um, so it seems to me, my personal opinion, is that this can present an amazing opportunity for intergenerational approaches to addressing social isolation, which would then reduce the vulnerability risk for both ends of the um, age spectrum, if you will. Um, I just think the opportunities really are limitless. We just need to be creative as we always are. And what I know for sure is that NASA and its members are just the people to make it happen. Wow. What a what a great call to action uh, to end this on. So thank you, Judy, uh, for your time today and for all that you do for investors. Thank um, you, everyone. So as Judy mentioned, uh, Senator Susan Collins was an original co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, and in her role as the then chair of the Senate Select Committee on Aging, helped make sure the bill became law. So we've been working with Senator Collins' office on commemorating the upcoming anniversary of the Senior Safe Act. And as part of the activities planned for that day, 
It's a short video from the Senator herself talking about the importance of protecting senior investors. She was gracious enough to provide us with some prepared remarks and we're pleased to share them with you today as we at NASA begin our work to mark the upcoming anniversary of the bill. Please enjoy this short video from Senator Collins. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to join in this celebration of the fifth anniversary of the Senior Safe Act. Your association played a key role in the passage of this landmark legislation. In fact, it was Maine Security administrator who first gave me the idea for this law based on her own mother's experience with a scam. This law is based on Maine's innovative Senior Save Program, a collaborative effort by the state's regulators, financial institutions, and aging and legal organizations to educate bank and credit union employees on how to identify and help stop the financial exploitation of vulnerable older Mainers. As a senator representing the oldest state in the country, I've consistently worked to fight fraud and financial exploitation targeted at our older Americans. When Senior Safe was signed into law on this date in 2018, regulators, financial institutions, and legal organizations gained effective new tools to educate their employees about how to identify, prevent, and report financial scams. The Senior Security Act I introduced with Senator Kirsten Sinema would further strengthen protections for seniors. Our bipartisan bill would create a task force within the Securities and Exchange Commission to coordinate state authorities and regulators' efforts to reduce the risk for senior investors of being defrauded. We have made substantial progress to protect seniors, but we must not relent in our effort to stop these relentless scammers. Your association is an invaluable part of this effort, and I thank you for all of your good work. Thank you again to Judy and to Senator Collins. Rich, I now turn the floor back over to you. Andrew, thank you. Uh, and thanks for putting that together. To Thanks to both you and Judy. Uh, you both have been huge helps in our efforts at NASA coordinating and collaborating with agencies, uh, the industry, other stakeholders, to make a difference. And that's what this show is about. As you pointed out, Andrew, we uh, we try to bring into uh, view uh, research, uh, learning, teaching, and lessons that people have learned in the field about how to mitigate fraud in the older investor uh, space. I'm happy uh, to introduce our first panel um, where we have with us from the Ontario Securities Commission, Tyler Fleming. Tyler, uh, bring yourself onto uh, stage here. And also with uh, the Ontario Se Securities Commission, we have Mira Pelagia, who is a researcher and is going to re uh, talk to us today about a paper that they put together uh, in investigating interesting new issues as it relates to senior, well, investors in general and the implications for seniors. Tyler, uh, Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the program. It's great to have you. Uh, why don't you, if you would, uh, give the audience an overview of the Ontario Securities Commission and the research arm uh, that you work with. 
For sure, and, and nice to see you, Rich, and great to see so many people uh, in attendance. And thank you to the NASA Senior Issues Committee for the invitation, and really happy to be here. Um, the Ontario Securities Commission, we are Canada's largest securities regulator. Um, we have about 650 full-time staff. Uh, Ontario has about 40% of Canada's population, and over half of Canada's um, equity market value comes from Ontario listed issuers, just to give some context on, on our um, jurisdiction. At the OSC, uh, I lead the Investor Office, which is a branch of the Ontario Securities Commission focused on retail investors. Um, we have three teams in the office, including a policy and regulatory team, uh, a financial education team, but also a uh, behavioral science and investor research team, which my colleague, uh, Dr. Mira Pelagia leads. Um, we're the only securities regulator in Canada to have a behavioral science team, a dedicated team. Uh, other international counterparts have also started building behavioral science capabilities, um, but in Canada, at least it's unique. I know the US SEC and FINRA also have done a lot of work in this area. Um, we're here to talk about a behavioral science study um, that we've conducted on gamification and digital engagement practices. Really excited to um, share some of our findings. Um, but I just wanted to share, we, we apply behavioral science in, in, in a few different ways. So, so we um, take various qualitative and, and quantitative approaches to understand investor thoughts, attitudes, behaviors. Um, but we also uh, undertake rigorous scientific experimentation to really test uh, possible um, policy solutions or, or approaches uh, to see how investors actually behave and respond to them. So we get some data from our approaches and that can produce some really interesting findings, including the ones on gamification we're talking about today. Thanks, uh, Tyler. I, 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 the, I first got uh, focused on OSC and the behavioral work uh, when you issued your study on um, trusted contact persons and methods to uh, increase the take rate among investors. And that was another fascinating study that we actually featured last year on this program. Mira, why don't you tell us a little bit about how behavioral study and the regulatory securities financial services industry intersect? Sure. Thanks, Rich. Um, so behavioral science is really a novel way of approaching securities regulation. So traditionally, the way securities regulators have attempted to change behavior um, is really through information provision. So for example, through disclosures um, that let folks know about, about any risks or through the use of carrots and sticks, so incentives and penalties. And behavioral science suggests that beyond having the right information and the right incentives in place, the context in which choices are presented actually plays a really important role in how people ultimately make decisions and behave. So our field really strives to make what we know about human cognition, memory, biases, and attention to really design solutions that ultimately improve policies and programs. So we don't think of behavioral science as a substitute for traditional regulatory approaches. Um, instead, it's really meant to be a complementary lens and potentially bolster the effectiveness of regulation. So uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the study that you're going to present and tell the audience why the study of digital engagement practices, which I think is the broadest term that you can use for the subject we're discussing, why it's important to better understand how digital engagement practices can impact an investor's method of interfacing with technology and their own investment choices. Yeah, for sure, Rich. And so all of us are used to digital engagement practices by now, um, whether it's through the internet, through apps, um, social media. We've all experienced these digital practices for many years now. That's not new. Um, we've also seen how gamification um, can be used to improve our experience. We need just as users or clients in a variety of contexts. So, for instance, if you try to learn a new language through Duolingo, or if you're uh, into fitness and use Strava, you know, there's badges, points, for all sorts of techniques that, that engage us and motivate us. So, so that's not new, but what is new is um, the use of these techniques in a retail investing context. So in recent years, we have seen um, the emergence or growth of, of new investing platforms, 
uh, often aimed at younger investors, but which all investors are taking advantage of, including senior investors um, that employ some of these techniques. And so we wanted to look at it, really get a sense of um, how they're being used, um, define some of the terms. As you say, there's a lot of terms that can be used, digital engagement practices, gamification, uh, et cetera. And um, get some data on, on how these are impacting investor behavior and, and, and we found some really interesting findings. So that was kind of the, the fundamental reason we first started looking at it. These techniques are growing in use uh, and we can just anticipate they'll continue to do so in the future. Right. And of course, with the development of any new technology or you know thing, call it what you will, there's potential for uh, usages that are good. And I suppose there's potential for concern about how the engagement practices impact people, perhaps in a way that would make regulators unhappy. That's exactly right, Rich. And a lot of it is context dependent. Um, in our world, we've, we've heard a lot in recent years about how to use gamification to help uh, with investor education, right? To help people learn um, about securities, about investing. And there can be a lot of really positive uses in that respect. But the flip side is there can be downsides, and that's part of what we explored in our study. So both the positives and the negatives. So, uh, Mira, um, is gamification a digital engagement practice? Yes, it is. So digital engagement practices are really defined as the tools, including behavioral techniques, um, things like differential marketing, gamification, design elements, uh, or design features that either intentionally or unintentionally engage with retail investors on digital platforms, um, as well as analytical and technological tools and methods. So we use the term behavioral techniques to refer to digital engagement practices that use insights from behavioral science in ways that can influence investor behavior. And so gamification refers to a variety of behavioral techniques that integrate those game related elements into non-gaming contexts and applications. And the purpose of this is really to improve user experience and engagement. So it's, it's a value neutral thing, um, but could pose um, potential issues. Um, and so there are various types of digital engagement practices and gamification techniques. Um, so I can walk through some of the concepts just to just to illustrate some examples. So uh, there are techniques like gamification. So this incorporates features that are typically used in gambling. So for instance, we know that when you give someone rewards in a variable way rather than in a consistent way, um, we see that it actually can increase the frequency of a target behavior. Um, we know that things like leaderboards showing rankings of other users can um, play a role in what people decide to do. So we see uh, leaderboards in various fitness and, and game apps. So, for example, um, the popular language app Duolingo also makes use of leaderboards. Um, and non-economic non rewards is another strategy that's used, and that's actually the target of um, the experiment that we we carry out. Um, so typically, rewards that have even negligible economic value can have the potential to increase a given behavior. Other kinds of gamification techniques include goal or progress framing to increase the behavior, showing where a person is uh, in reaching their end goal. We know strategies like providing uh, feedback, making a given um, target behavior or something in the environment very salient and attention grabbing can help engage users. And um, we know that social dynamics are really important. So the, what we see other people doing can play a role in what we actually end up doing by acting as a cue as to what we should do in a given situation. So a lot of these techniques really can help enhance the user experience and help investor outcomes. Um, but there is the potential that the target behaviors might not always be optimal for the investor. Um, so for example, if the behavior, uh, the, the technique leads to increasing frequency of trades, that might be a suboptimal strategy for many investors. Uh, this is a question or a comment to both of you. I, I did notice that this space is so new 
that even having a language to describe what it is uh, that is being studied was was one of the purposes of your study to kind of create a uniformity in the phraseology one uses in this space. Can you talk a little bit about that absence of, I'll just say, uh, a uniform uh, way of speaking of this space? Yeah, for sure. So one common thing we've observed is that people use the term gamification really broadly to mean things that are not truly gamification, but are other sorts of digital engagement practices. So in our study, we've, we've identified five specific gamification techniques that Mira just mentioned, um, but also set to define what is not a gamification technique. Um, Mira mentioned at the outset, there's other digital engagement practices as well, use of dark patterns, differential marketing that doesn't fall in that category and that we're doing some interesting work on right now separately. Um, but it was really important, you know, as regulators, as stakeholders to, to use words with some precision um, so that we all know what we're talking about and can address it accordingly. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, I will say that I do think gamification has become kind of like Kleenex has become to tissues. It's it's in the parlance and it's what you see uh, frequently regulators speak of. So some intellectual precision certainly makes a difference. So we know we're talking about the right things here. Let's get to um, the study. Um, and Mira, I'm gonna direct this to you. Uh, you, you actually modeled uh, with two gamification studies uh, what happens when investors are cued with these, uh, I'll say stimuli that you're describing. So tell us a little bit about the gamification techniques and, and what you were studying. Sure, yeah. So we ran an experiment with uh, over 2,400 retail investors. Uh, so this was an online experiment with simulated trades um, and simulated decision-making. Um, and it was looking at the impact of two different gamification techniques. So in this trading simulation, uh, participants started off with $10,000 um, of hypothetical money, and they were asked to trade six stocks over the seven weeks of trading. And the stocks were based on real stocks and real data, but were renamed for this experiment. And the total length of the experiment um, was something participants can do in one sitting. So one experimental condition is the effect of points. Um, so these are points with no economic value or very little economic value for buying or selling stocks. So it's a form of reward that's not linked to any real monetary outcome, but just really the action of buying and selling can, can garner you more points. If, if I can just interrupt a second, by because I, when I was fascinated when I read this, by n little economic value, it, it may be as little as 0.01 cents could be added to somebody's account, right? So you're talking about really nominal value. Yeah, so around it could be between one and three cents. So so it is quite negligible um, in uh, what the monetary outcome is as a result of engaging in the behavior that gets you points. Um, and so that was one thing that we looked at. And another thing that we looked at is the effect of top traded lists. So this shows the stocks that are held by the most individuals. And we contrasted both of these conditions against a control condition. And the control condition just acts as a reference point and a comparison point. So here participants saw a trading screen, but didn't uh, get any points or didn't see any top traded lists. Uh, otherwise, everything was exactly the same. So by testing against this control condition, we're able to isolate the effects of points and the top trading lists to see how they influence behavior. And so I'll pull up um, a slide just to show you the results of the experiment. And so this shows us that um, the effect was actually quite astounding. Um, so the participants who were rewarded with points made 39% more trades than the control group. So it was a statistically significant finding and uh, just the size of the, the finding was, was very large. Um, and what this really indicates is that even if you're giving points that have negligible economic value, um, that it can actually drive 
trading behavior. Um, and, uh, and that was very, very interesting to us. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, that outcome is astounding. I mean, to think that something with no real value made that much of a difference in the trade frequency is is unbelievable. Exactly. And that was something um, it, it was surprising, just the size of this effect, um, because it was the only thing that was varied between the control condition and the points condition. So participants saw some points, knew, were fully aware that they would not be benefiting really economically um, from earning these points, but it still resulted in a steep increase in the number of trades. And our second finding from this experiment was around the top traded list. So what we saw with the top traded list is that the participants that were in this condition uh, were 14% more likely than participants in the control group to own those top listed stocks. So they ended up um, filling up um, they, what they had with a lot of these stocks on the top traded list as a result of just seeing the list. Um, so they don't have any data or evidence indicating these actually perform better. All they're seeing is that people tend to hold these more than they do other stocks. So, so, so uh, what is it that you're, I mean, the, what is the connection that you're studying there between what people feel, I'll say, when they see there's a top traded list? It's it's wanting to be like peers or, or what is it? Yeah, so there's a lot of evidence in behavioral science that shows that people look for cues from others in their surroundings as to how to behave. Um, so fitting into the social norm, whether it's a conscious or unconscious decision, um, is actually something that dictates a lot of our behavior. Um, so we know that social norms can, can be used for good. So if you're highlighting a social norm, which is something that people tend to do a lot of, uh, that helps people engage in that behavior more. Um, but if it's something that's problematic, um, it can actually lead to the same effect that people are more likely to engage in a problematic behavior. So we know that that's a, that's, that's a big driver of of what we what we decide to do and the decisions that we make. I, I remember actually from the, t the trusted contact person study that one of the things the participants were told was Canadians generally approve of the notion of a trusted contact person. It's the same kind of dynamic there that you would try to influence behavior by highlighting social acceptance, right? Absolutely. So it's it's an effect that um, is, uh, you know, it's something that we see in various different domains um, that people tend to follow what they think the norm is. I could just add to which I'm glad you mentioned the TPT project. Your sound is dropping out just a little bit, Tyler. Take a little closer and better. Yeah. Thank you. So in that case, um, what we found is through some behavioral interventions, we were able to increase the uptake of the TCP by 20%. So one in five investors would appoint a TCP solely because of these behavioral um, changes to the, the form that, that asked if someone wanted to appoint a TCP. So that really shows the power of some of these techniques to make a difference for, in that case, for positive investor outcomes, but as we're talking today, potentially negative investor outcomes. Um, I wanted to mention too, NASA is going to make available a link to the research we're talking about today. People can find it on the OSC website, but a bit of a shortcut is that our, our uh, branch website investoroffice.ca. Uh, it's under the research and behavioral science section now. It's a quick way to find all the studies we're talking about. Thanks a lot. I know the listeners are going to be curious, and that and if you haven't read the OSC report on the TCP, you should because, I mean, I don't know any regulator, I don't know any industry member that wouldn't wish for greater uptake on trusted contact persons. It's an essential tool to mitigate harm. We'll be talking about it more later on the second panel, but. Thanks for that, Tyler. So let's talk about, you, you've done the research, you've, the, the conclusions are fascinating. Now what, how, does, how do we take this and, and make recommendations for the industry, for regulators? I mean, what do we do with these research findings? So it, it's a great question, Rich. Um, one thing I 
say is a key takeaway from our work is that regulators, state and other key agencies are but whether some of these agencies um, that attributes in providing advice or recommendations um, in that it's by the investigation presented. And if so, that may warrant regulatory your sound, for some reason, Tyler, your sound is still dropping out. I have to apologize, but we want to hear what you're saying, and we still have time for you to repeat even what you just said. So why don't you give it another go? Sure. I hope you can hear me a little bit. Um, yeah, when you're that close, we can hear you. Okay, I'll just speak a little louder. I'll speak a little louder. Um, so a, a key takeaway, though, for all of us is to consider where the, whether the use of some of these techniques, um, uh, whether they have attributes similar to the provision of advice or recommendations. And if so, um, that may warrant potentially uh, a regulatory responses of some sort. Um, we also recommend that industry, that regulators uh, continue to collect data um, and discuss some of these techniques. We just spoke about two specific techniques, but there are many different gamification and, and digital engagement practices we've yet to collect data on. Um, so I think that's something for all of us collectively to continue uh, to explore. And then, as I said earlier, you know, the, the experiment showed some potential downsides to these two techniques when it comes to investor outcomes. But there are positive uses of gamification and other practices, uh, and there are downsides. So we're hoping to just continue the conversation and, and help um, the learning uh, of all of us um, in what is a relatively and do you have any conclusions on, on in these studies? I know they weren't specifically focused on retirement stage investors, but are there implications that either of you could discuss about what, you know, how it may impact uh, a, a user class that may not be on their phone all the time like younger people do, but the dynamics are going to seep into a space that's occupied by the retirement stage investors at some point or another. So. What what does this mean to uh, retirement stage investors? Do either of you think? Well, it's always important to avoid broad generalizations um, about different types of investors. So these these platforms are not just used by younger investors. Many older investors are already using these platforms that with, that employ gamification and other techniques. Um, we can also expect though they'll continue to grow in use, including among traditional platforms. So. Um, where there may be um, uh, more older investors on, on those sorts of platforms, it's only going to continue to grow. So I think it's important for us all to, uh, number one, educate investors, um, all investors about these techniques and this area and help us all be mindful of some of our biases and, and uh, the way we behave in different contexts. So the investor education piece is key. Um, and then also when it comes to the services that the financial industry provides, um, keeping in mind some of the positive and, and negative influences and how they engage with their retail, senior retail investor client base, I think is really important. So we all have a role to play in this one. That's very thoughtful. I agree. I mean, it's it just reminds me that when people have superpowers, you hope they use them for good and not evil. Um, and 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 the power of this is uh, undeniable. I mean, the 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 difference in the trading pattern, you know, by getting a non-economic reward was is just a phenomenal outcome. Mira and Tyler, I cannot thank you both enough uh, for coming on board. It was great to have you. Uh, we're going to pivot now, uh, and and good afternoon to you both. We're going to pivot now to our friends from the Finra Education Foundation. I am. Happy to introduce Jerry Walsh and her colleague, Olivia Valdez. Welcome to uh, NASA Presents, Jerry and Olivia. It's good to have you back. Uh, you're, you're alums. You were, you were the first uh, actually guest to kick off the program last year, I recall. So it's good to see you again. Uh, Jerry, um, for the audience's benefit, why don't you, if you would, Tell us about FINRA Education Foundation and, and the work that it does, uh, because it's it's good stuff. People should know about it. Rich, I'm happy to, and thank you so much, and thank you uh, to the NASA Advisory Committee for having us here today. And, you know, if I could sum up what we do in 
two words. It's the poster behind me, Thinking Money, um, which is now a long ago uh, documentary that we created to look at the behaviors that made people susceptible to financial fraud. And it applied not only to older investors, but to all investors, um, because as Tyler and Mira said, um, you know, all investors are subject to these biases. So the FINRA Foundation's entire mission is to help underserved audiences in the United States get the skills and knowledge and information that they need for financial success throughout their life. And we do that uh, primarily through outreach programs, often in partnership with nonprofits and state regulators, the SEC, other federal regulators, um, but also through research. The investing landscape is changing dramatically, not merely because of the digital engagement practices that Mira and Tyler shared with us, um, but we're seeing a shift in new investors coming into our markets. And we've done uh, a series of research projects, um, including um, the Consumer Insight series that we've been doing with NORC at the University of Chicago. But against that backdrop, we've been doing research uh, every three years through our National Financial Capability Study. And part of that is a, an investor study component. And you're able to slice and dice um, demographic information, um, on different behaviors, attitudes, uh, knowledge levels across a wide variety of financial topics like planning ahead and making decisions about financial products. The cool thing about the National Financial Capability Study is that you're able to slice and dice the data by not only the traditional age and gender demographics, um, but also sexual orientation and gender identity, disability status, um, you know, race, ethnicity. It's, it's just a really rich data set. I will not talk about that. Um, what we want to talk about today um, is sort of the newer investors that are coming into our market. And most of the insights that we've gained on that has been through the NORC Consumer Insights Program um, but we, it's also borne out, and um, in some ways, the, the data is replicated in the National Financial Capability Study. Yeah. While I'm thinking of it, I know it's not kind of in our script here and covering your the new research, but why don't you take a minute to tell everybody about what we're planning for World Elder Abuse uh, Awareness Day. You're hosting uh, a multi-agency uh, senior safe training, and it was you know, Senator Collins on it's pretty cool and it gives us context for the importance of that training. So can you talk a little bit about that? Delighted to. And just picture this stage right here and then add Lori Schock, the wonderful Lori Schock from the Securities and Exchange Commission, and uh, you'll have your faculty. Um, but on June 15th, we will be having a webinar that will focus on the Senior Safe Act. And of course, that's a, a piece of legislation that, you know, really helps firms uh, equip their reps to be able to do something about financial exploitation when they see it. And the Senior Safe Act training um, is one component um, for firms to meet that obligation uh, under the act so that they can get the safe harbor. Um, basically, it allows you to tell, tell someone um, that you suspect something is wrong. And that's such a powerful thing to be able to do. So June 15, watch this space. Um, we will be back with even more information. Terrific. Yeah, it is important. And as we'll discuss in the second segment covering investment advisory firms, smaller investment advisory firms are vastly underserved and undertrained and under, you know, you know, they just don't have the resources and knowledge to handle frequently the issues that arise in exploitation. So having a training like this, which gives them basically, I don't know, three quarters of seven eight or seven eighths of what they'll need to get toward qualification of uh, under the Senior Safe Act for the immunity is is a big deal. Olivia, and, and yeah, if I could just make a quick plug that on yeah. uh, FINRA's website and I believe serve our seniors, the SEC has links to the training that we put together together um, in collaboration, but. 
It's also, you can turn it in, you can, it's SCORM compliance, so you can put it into your learning management system. But if you're a smaller firm that doesn't have one, you can use the PowerPoint. It's turnkey and super easy. Right. And that, that was the whole idea of it. So that is that is on your website. It's on Serve Our Seniors. So you can find it there and the commission's website. Olivia, uh, it's your turn. Uh, I know that you have a lot to say about this report, which studies investors who first uh, entered the market in 2020 and then later on closer to our time now. And these obviously have been volatile times in the market. And I'm not going to you know, uh, give away any of the conclusions of your report. But what I found to be fascinating is that there is persistent uh, desire to participate in the financial markets by new investors. And that's a good thing. I mean, because we want people, obviously, to be invested. So tell us about the idea for your study and, and, and what you did. Yeah, so thank you, Rich. Um, we first uh, wanted to know about these pandemic investors. So these investors who joined the market in 2020, because like you mentioned, there was so much volatility in the market. So there was more spare time. A lot of sporting events weren't happening. Um, they couldn't go out with their friends. Just a lot of things that were usually the case were not. Um, and then there was also this like cash flow with um, government stimulus money that a lot of households received. So that created this trifecta of um, new investors joining the market. And we wanted to just learn more about them. And so, you know, back then we gained a lot of insights about these new investors. They were demographically much more diverse. They were younger um, racially and ethnically. We saw more black and um, Hispanic investors than ever before. Um, people with lower incomes, with lower account balances were joining the market. And, you know, it was very encouraging in that way. Um, and, you know, some other things that we found were a little bit more concerning, and I, I'll get over, I'll, I'll start, you know, talk about that a little bit more later. But like you mentioned, back then, one of our main questions was, are, they haven't really experienced a market downturn. Um, they haven't maybe experienced the tax implications of investing, what's going to happen when they do. And so even when we first collected that data, we wanted to see long term what was going to happen to those investors. Um, so flash forward to 2022, and we got a chance to go back to those original investors and basically ask, well, where are they now? Are they still investing? And that was really our main question. Are they still investing? And the good news is, by and large, they are. So 75% of those new investors are still in the market today. Um, a fair amount of them are saying that they don't know if their account is open. Um, but and so 75% of new investors is, is a pretty uh, large number that we were very happy to find. So uh, you put together two uh, briefs, right? And tell tell the I know, I know you have longer studies, and then you're 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 you've innovated a little bit. Everything can't be a, a long, detailed study, and if there's something that comes up. I know you want to kind of be uh, nimble and be able to issue reports that are shorter, but still deliver a message. So talk a little bit about that and then tell us about the two briefs you put out on this topic. Right. So one of the benefits of this consumer insight series is that, you know, the investing world and the investing climate is ever changing and trends arrive so quickly that um, our, our big project our big research endeavor of the foundation is the NFCS, which is wonderful, as Jerry mentioned, but it doesn't give us um, that ability to react quickly. Um, and so with the Consumer Insights um, series, we're able to see a trend and then catch it and produce high quality research on it. And so this is how these briefs became. Um, we studied pandemic investors back in 2020, we went at them again in 2022. And another brief uh, that we also did was, you know, we looked at these 2020 investors. We actually collected that data in um, November, October of 2020. And if you remember, just a couple months after in 21, in January 2021, we had 
you know, the meme stock craze and, and the game stock investing, um, you know, post that we also had a market downturn, the crypto crashes. And so we wanted to see, well, what about the new, new investors? So we had our 2020 new investors, but what about those who had joined the market in 21 or 22? What did they look like? Um, yeah. So that was another brief that we did. Okay, so why don't we talk about the first one, which was the study of the 2020 investors. What what were the findings? So um, in general, demographically, we saw that, you know, like I already mentioned, these folks, they were younger. We had more Black and Hispanic investors, lower income, lower account balances. I mean, a third of these new investors had account balances under $500. Um, in other ways, um, these pandemic investors who joined in 2020, they behaved similarly to more experienced investors. So they said that they had similar risk tolerance levels. Um, you know, some of their desires for long term or their goals for investing were similar. Um, but we also saw some differences, for instance, on information sources, who they relied on. Uh, lots of people citing friends and family, uh, very few citing financial professionals. So there were some differences between those who joined in 2020 and those who had joined uh, previously. Um, I mean, right. So it, does it make sense then to go to your more recent or the study of the more recent group and how the two groups of investors compare? Yeah, so our most recent group uh, our 2020 new investors versus the 2022. And I know there's there's a lot of research on new investors and in different categories in the mix. So it can get kind of confusing. But um, in general, these new investors who are investing in traditional non-retirement accounts, they're very similar. In 2020 and 2022, we find few differences. Um, demographically, they're diverse in terms of their information sources, um, their influences, very, very similar. The big difference that we're seeing is in these crypto investors. So in 2022, an additional component is that a lot of people are joining the market, not necessarily through brokerage accounts, but through the purchase of crypto. So in our newest research brief, when we looked at those 2022 investors, we also looked at people who were not trading on a brokerage firm, but they were purchasing crypto. And those were just drastically different from any other group of investors. Yeah, the crypto people definitely have a, a distinct profile uh, in a variety of ways. So why don't you talk about, you know, the findings in the more recent, uh, with the more recent study? Yeah, so the crypto, uh, people who are only investing in crypto, so they don't have any traditional brokerage account um, investments, they, uh, they're they relying on social media more than other investors. They are not using financial professionals. Lots of them are using um, friends and families, not just as information sources, but we're seeing that crypto investors are four times more likely than those traditional investors to cite that a friend's suggestion was what inspired them to open their investing account in the in the first place. Kind of so ties I'm, back to the peer approval thing that we discussed in uh, with the Ontario folks. Yeah, and actually a lot that that was such an interesting study, and it matches a lot of what we found too. So specifically, crypto users they really like free stock or free crypto, free stock, these kind of rewards that are offered in a lot of these platforms are driving um, a lot of these folks to the to trade. Or and they're not much, trade. They're much more honest about, um, or they're much more willing to say that, yeah, I'm doing this to take risk. I'm doing this to speculate. I know that I'm taking risk. Um, and that was fascinating to see um, because it, uh, it it was a marked difference from the more traditional uh, investors. Well, and it's comforting, isn't it? As a regulator, I'm happy to hear that the people that are playing with a speculative vehicle understand that they are in a speculative 
vehicle. I mean, uh, in the in the older investor space, uh, you may have heard me say this. I say people, older people should think of kryptonite when they hear crypto. They sh just shouldn't touch it uh, because it's not for them. Um, but anyway, so um, also fascinating was I and you and I think you had this in both the briefs was you, you guys actually had people answer a, a five question, I'll say test. Um, and I was really disappointed by the results of, of correct and the number of correct answers in the five. So can you talk a little bit about that, either Jerry or Olivia? I, I can get started and then Olivia can tell me I'm wrong or or make it make it sound better and, and pithier and prettier. Um, but basically, the people who opened accounts in 2020 who said that one of the motivations, um, one of their prime motivations was that they wanted to learn about investing, in fact, did. Their financial knowledge scores went up on the investing quiz that we gave them. Now, the disappointing news, as you note, Rich, is that those scores are low. So they were lower in 2020 than they were in 2022. People did learn something. Um, but we also take a little bit of comfort in knowing that um, the people in 2020 who were very much, you know, relying on friends and family, they were not necessarily using financial professionals, they were more likely to say that they were turning to financial professionals and to their brokerage firms for educational information, um, which I think is also something that is uh, of comfort. Um, so that experiential learning, this is just a hypothesis, but it seems like that experiential learning does do something. And Olivia, I think there were some really fascinating findings about the crypto investors separate from the traditional investors, right? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of what their goals are, crypto investors are largely saying that they want to learn about investing. And we've seen um, that learning, you know, that goal of learning is actually resulting in actual learning. So even though we're seeing that knowledge scores are low, they are getting higher. So it does seem that that experiential learning is helping. We're also seeing um, perhaps because of some of that experiential learning in, in terms of information sources, Back in 2020, we saw that a lot of folks were saying that they were relying on other personal information. Um, lots of new investors saying that they didn't really use financial professionals. And we're seeing a reverse of that. So when we followed up with them in 22, we saw that a lot more of them were saying, you know, I'm actually using financial professionals than they did back in 2020. It went from the number six most cited source all the way to number three. So even though financial, their investment knowledge is low, maybe they're realizing some of their deficit and going to someone who knows more than they do. So uh, I we we got a little sidetracked when you were describing that uh, the peer uh, referral was one of the big motivators for those that are in the crypto investing uh, space. Uh, what other conclusions did the new report uh, show? So on the crypto topic, um, an interesting thing that we see is that just like we used to, we've seen that retirement accounts for 1Ks are an on-ramp to um, investing in non-retirement accounts, it seems like crypto may be a new on-ramp toward traditional investment. So about a third of those who had purchased crypto said that that purchase had made them more or much more interested in trading in the stock market. So that's another kernel of good news that, you know, crypto, I mean, it's, it's out there. So we're seeing that just as many people are entering the markets through these traditional methods of trading and non-retirement accounts as they are by trading crypto, but the good news is that it may be an on-ramp toward actual uh, traditional investing as well. Were they asked uh, to kind of follow on Ontario's observations? Were they asked whether digital engagement practices like points or banners or, you know, call it what you will, uh, in any way influence their decision when, how to invest? Or was that so, not part of it? 
We didn't ask in terms of what decisions it influenced, but we did ask them, do you find different digital engagement practices helpful? Do you find that these enhance your, uh, your experience or detract? And we saw that in general, crypto users have uh, more positive reactions to our digital engagement practices. But within, you know, that in general digital engagement practices, there seemed to be a preference for those practices that um, are more about learning or customizing your experience, less so things like um, creating avatars or um, games of chance. That type of thing doesn't seem to be endorsed as much as customization and learning. Those digital engagement practices are um, very much so enjoyed by these uh, investors. So two things from the audience. Jerry, if you'd be kind enough to give the websites again that you cited previously, I, I know you mentioned Serve Our Seniors, which is on the NASA website, but what are the FINRA, what's the FINRA website where they can find the training that we discussed? Right. It's on FINRA.org. And um, uh, if you just search for Senior Safe Act training, you'll get to a landing page that has the PowerPoint and also has instructions on accessing the SCORM file. All right. Thank you kindly. And then we have a question, Olivia, based on your comments about a comparison of the financial literacy scores of the new investors compared the new traditional investors versus investors uh, in crypto. And I know that was one of your takeaways was there was a differential that may not be what you would have expected. Yeah, so we looked at, and so we didn't just look at general investing knowledge, we also looked at crypto knowledge. So we designed a crypto, a five item crypto quiz. And we saw that in the general investing knowledge, people had lower, um, hold on, let me, let me get this right. <laughs> So in terms of crypto ver crypto only investors versus traditional investors, there's no difference in general investing knowledge. The crypto knowledge, um, and thank goodness, right, you'd expect this, is higher among those who trade crypto than among those who do not. Um, that being said, crypto own only um crypto only investors tend to overestimate their knowledge relative to uh, non-crypto owners about investing. So even though their investing knowledge is a bit higher in the space of crypto, they're overinflating how much they actually know. Yeah. they Actually, to me, the only bad news in this report, because it, it seems like there's some you know favorable conclusions that you are correlating here, but I think around two, the, the the average was about two out of five questions that are not complicated questions, by the way, were answered correctly on either side of the aisle here. So, you know, more proof that financial literacy, and these are younger people, obviously, too, that you're talking to, um, I'm assuming that that are involved with the crypto. I, I, I think the ages are right They They tend yeah. to be overall younger and new entrants to the market. So, Jerry, um, thanks, Olivia. Jerry, what are the key takeaways here? And let's and we have a minute or two to talk about, you know, what's on the front burner for what's next at FINRA Education Foundation. Well, we know that we have to um, really meet people where they are when it comes to investing, because friends and family, you know, even as there is this shift from the 2020 new investors two years later, they were more likely to be focusing on financial professionals. Um, but we really need to educate a broad swath of the population if people are turning to their friends and family um, for advice. And you know, um, recognizing the different motivations that different demographic groups have even within these new investors is important. Um, you know, back in the 2020 uh, initial survey collection, um, there were a lot of people who had money from stimulus payments and they were thinking, well, OK, I'll, I'll try investing. And luckily, you know, upwards of 75 percent plus are still in the markets. That's good news. Um, but this tide, you know, back in 2020, we kept hearing about the influx of new investors. We don't hear about that anymore. And yet our research suggests that that tide has not stemmed. We are seeing 
younger and younger people. And so we've got to reach them where they are. And we're competing with so much else. There are so many channels of news and information that people get that isn't traditional media, that isn't regulators' websites. And so how can we be where they are, whether that's in the workplace or taking a step back um, to being in schools um, and and reaching people when they're younger, uh, maybe in in K-12 or college. Um, And so those are tactics that the FINRA Foundation, uh, like many other financial education and investor education, uh, nonprofits and experts are really trying to engage in. Yeah. So we had a couple of questions. One, I think, is not the subject of the study is to what extent artificial uh, intelligence is impacting investor behavior. I guess the answer for now is we don't really know. I'm not sure that anybody's, you know, uh, taken that issue on. Um, and our, the, there is there is a question, though, that I think the study did address, and that is, are new investors relying on online financial advice, such as so- social media influencers? And my recollection is that there, there was a silo of people that looked online for financial advice. I'm not sure they specifically mentioned social influencers, But definitely there was a group of people that did seek information online and one inevitably would run into social influencers if you spend enough time online. And I'll add that the way that we ask about financial professionals, um, we ask them, do you rely on a financial professional? That depends on their definition. So it's possible that if you think someone that you follow on TikTok just really knows what they're doing and you consider them a financial professional, that may be bleeding into that item as well. All right. Well, once again, uh, very interesting to hear what you're up to. Uh, we we appreciate you coming on to NASA Presents. Jerry, I'll look forward to seeing you around the bend for the Senior Save training and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. Appreciate you coming on board here. Thanks for having us. Of course. So next up, uh, James, probably now is as good a time as any to show the code for the participants for the CLA. Thank you kindly. 148597 is the continuing education code. We'll show show this another code at the end, 148597. So segment two, uh, something I've really been looking forward to because I know there's a need for this in the space, and that is investment advisor focused problems and solutions dealing with uh, elder exploitation and how to tackle it. Um, So I'm going to bring on board Rodney War from Wells Fargo, Jen Zaro from XML Financial, and William Nelson from the Investment Advisor Association, each of whom is uh, immersed in this space. Uh, William is now Associate Counsel, General Counsel at the IAA, but he was in the he was in, pardon me, the CCO seat at a large investment advisor once upon a time, and so knows what that feels like. Jen. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum is, you know, frequently seen on the circuit. I, I was with her, the Senior Investor Protection Program in, in late March and uh, works with a smaller firm, XML. We'll talk a little bit about that. And Rodney and Wells, I mean, uh, this is this is somebody who has uh, had the benefit of working with Ron Long for years and uh, is is trying to fill the shoes uh, left open by Ron's uh, departure at the beginning of this year. Welcome uh, to the program, folks. Thank you, Rich. Thank yeah, you, thank Rich. You so much. Yeah, it's it's great to see you. We've uh, we put together a good curriculum, and there's a lot to cover. So let's try to cover it. Um, one of the things I think the audience needs to hear uh, throughout this discussion is like, how is it different in the IA space as opposed to the broker dealer space? And and there are differences. There's a there's a lot of similarities, but there are differences. And so, expect to hear those kinds of things. And if the audience does have questions, please send them in. I'll try to field them as we go. Uh, and if we don't get to them in the segment, we will try to answer them after 
uh, the program is complete. So, William, I'm going to I'm going to go to you first. Okay. Um, what what does one need to think about to construct a system uh, on the IA side? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Rich. And thank you, everyone today who's joined us. So, you know, I think to start out, investment advisors should prioritize constructing robust systems to mitigate harm and prevent elder abuse or exploitation. Now, I'm going to talk about a few specific elements of what that program might be, but I think one overarching element of a successful program is centralization. So centralization plays a vital role in addressing elder financial exploitation by ensuring consistent and effective handling of cases. Uh, so for instance, record keeping should be centralized to maintain comprehensive and accurate documentation of reported cases, investigations, and outcomes. Internal tracking systems should be centralized to track the progress of ongoing cases, share relevant information among team members, and coordinate actions between departments. External reporting mechanisms should be centralized to enable efficient reporting of suspected instances of elder financial exploitation with uh, law enforcement, adult protective services, or such other appropriate authorities. Um, and Rich, I'm also happy to talk about some of the different elements I've seen um, in very successful programs at investment advisors. Yeah, well, why don't you, you're, you're up here now, why don't you talk a little bit about what you've seen that works? Yeah, sure. So I think there's um, a handful of different areas. I know we're going to talk about some of these today uh, during the program, but you know, the first I would say is conduct a risk assessment, you know, a thorough risk assessment to identify potential vulnerabilities and areas of concern within your investment advisory process. Second, training and education. Uh, provide comprehensive training and education to all staff. So again, this isn't just focused on client-facing staff, uh, operations staff, investment staff, um, even the executive staff. Uh, is again, they want to be involved in giving them that education is incredibly helpful as well. Uh, you know, uh, help them with prevention strategies, appropriate response protocols. Uh, proactive monitoring is another success. Um, you know, detect warning signs of elder abuse or exploitation. Um, could be unusual financial transactions, uh, sudden changes in account activity. Uh, develop and implement internal policies and procedures to address these concerns. So again, having those policies and procedures then training on those policy procedures is incredibly important. Again, protocols for reporting, protocols for investigating cases, and also having proper escalation procedures. So, um, and also, yeah, go ahead, Rich. No, it's okay, William. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about smaller investment advisors and hearing mm -hmm. the laundry list of things that yes. have to be done. So I'm gonna turn now to my friend, Jen Zaro. How, how how does one do it when you're not working at a major investment advisory firm as as William did? What do you do when it's a one person, two person, three person, ten person firm? Rich, this is why I love doing these with you because you ask these questions, right? So we have William that has great advice and guidance, right? And you're asking the question, right? As a firm, I'm a small firm. We have 50 employees. What does the risk assessment look like, right? We have risk assessments for a lot of different you know, issues, right? We have products. Um, so let me talk with my fellow investment advisory firms. Um, and these are really ones that are dealing with the retail investors. You know your business, you know your clients, you know your advisors, the cast of characters that you have. The this is where you start with, OK, let's look at our client base. What are what are the demographics of our clients? You know, the ones that you've been working with for 20 years, you know, do they have a spouse? Do they have children? So really, first, take a look at the entire client base and see what advisors are working with. That's your risk assessment is do we have you know a lot of older clients? And do they have family members? Do we know those family members? All right. Um, that's really kind of the risk assessment. And start looking at within those, where are your problems? And a lot of those, you'll know. You'll say, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about these particular clients. They have um, 
children that are kind of estranged, they came back into the picture. So that's kind of the risk assessment. I'll go into the next thing is the training, William. Okay, training. This is really where, Rich, the resources that Jerry mentioned and that are on the NASA website are phenomenal. And I will share with the firms, this is a PowerPoint presentation. It's put together. The materials are phenomenal. And they're intended to comply with the Senior Safe Act. So that does apply to the federal investment advisors. And I'm sure you've already had instances where your advisors are kind of wondering, you know what, something doesn't seem right by them going through the training and working with you and your compliance staff. For me, it's me, myself, and I. I am the compliance department. Yeah. I am the single point of contact, right? Everything comes to me. So yeah. the training will be what to watch for and then what to do about it. I'll tell my advisors, the first thing you do is if something doesn't seem right, like let's talk about it before things escalate. Um, so the training is important to identify. You comply with the Senior Safe Act and that provides you the immunity that um, Jerry had talked about. So monitoring, William. We'll talk about monitoring. A lot of firms, we rely on our custodians. We might rely on our billing system and uh, to aggregate those reports. Um, my strategy is aggregating like three to six months worth of ACH and withdrawals. Do I see a trend? Sometimes it's hard to find a trend in a one month category, but start looking at some of those reports that you're already running, let's say for to comply with some sort of custody rule, right? Sometimes we have to run the ACH wires and journals, start looking at patterns for activity and especially the higher um, range, you know, the older adults. Uh, and then talk with the advisor if you see unusual activity. Yeah, the, so, the having people yeah. react promptly is so important. And training people not to try to navigate this on their own is so important. You, you have to get it into the hands of a pro quickly, because as our friend pointed out, Mike Duff uh, from Jones said, you can lose 48 years worth of retirement savings in 48 hours, right? And it's so true. We've seen it time and time again. Rodney, I'm going to pivot to you. Uh, large firm, obviously, Wells Fargo. Uh, but you are kind of, you know, best in class with your program. Um, what do you think the keys are in the construct of a program? And and is there really a, and just in the overall construct, is there a major difference between the broker dealer and investment advisory space? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I think there are so much more tools available to the broker dealer. I think FINRA has outlined some great stuff. You know, we've got trusted contact. We have ability to pause transactions. And I think with an investment advisor, they got to look for all the avenues available to them. I guess you'd start with what William was talking about, your disclosure agreement, um, how that's written and allowing abilities that we see is available to the broker dealer, maybe incorporate that in your disclosure agreement. You know, having verbiage about trusted contact, you know, the CFPB produced a document last year where it was encouraging financial institutions to adopt trusted contact. Um, I think that would be a great tool to add to your disclosure agreement, even if it's about pausing transactions, including that verbiage within your account disclosure agreement so that your clients know that this is a measure of protection that you've put in there. And it's a tool that you can use when necessary. And I think that's an important part of it. Um, understanding your state laws. There are some state laws that does permit um, financial institutions, not simply broker dealers, to pause transaction or pause a distribution, um, speaking with a reasonable person associated with the client. So understanding the laws within your state and engaging with the regulators to ensure that you have additional protections where you can. Those are really important. Um, working with agencies like the FBI. The FBI has some great training, great tools available to financial institutions and to local customers. Clients may not go on an FBI website. That is a great opportunity. When you have situations that arise that are large amounts of money, when I say large amounts of money, I'm talking about like $500,000 and plus, contacting the local FBI agency in your area, they can assist you in some of these situations and be a supporter 
with you and the client in trying to stop the money from leaving. Um, I think educating your clients is number one. We all see it from where I stand. I mean, the team that I work with, that's one of the things we see. Clients who have knowledge of the different types of scams or different ways in which people can exploit them are less likely to get involved. So educating your client as much, have pamphlets. Like I tell our financial advisors, like you go to a doctor's office, you may find pamphlets of all kinds you know, for all types of diseases that can, you know, inflict harm to you. Um, when you go to a financial office, you should have the various types of various types of scams that are available. Um, you can order those types of um, scams and brochures from the Federal Trade Commission. You can do a bulk order, free shipping, um, free all the way around. And you they have all different types and in various languages. I think those are great tools available to investment advisors that they can utilize, um, maximize um, when they're dealing, walk, talking with their clients. It's really important. Yeah. Rodney, I wanted to just share with you the, the brochures. That was something that you can order for free. So firms can order from the CFPB. And I think there's a link, Rich, on the NASA Serving Our Seniors website. Um, and the FTC.gov has you know, um, bookmarks and things that you can order for free. Right. A lot of investment advisors, small firms, we like to get the free stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but educating clients, um, we actually put on a webinar on Monday for our clients. And a lot of firms, you know, we are looking for ways to engage our clients, take advantage of industry um, resources that are offering to do a cybersecurity or scam alert for your clients. So whether it's, you know, fund companies or you can talk with, you know, looking online on FTC, they have some sort of webinars that you might want to share with your clients. So those are some good resources. We're always looking for touch points with our clients. No, no doubt about it. So let's, let's move on to um, client handling issues. Once we have something that we suspect is not, <clears throat> pardon me, right. Rodney, I, I know you've done this a thousand times if you've done it once uh when you when you're dealing with clients and trying to get through to them on something you know is not right you know what what are the what are the best practices you find i think first you got to assess the situation by and large i think investment advisors have a close relationship with their clients so they can they can see the red flags before it even happens which is a plus you know, you know your client, you've had a longstanding relationship. I think another is we have to be careful about ageism. You know, everybody aged differently. You, somebody who's 80 may be a lot more alert and sharp than someone who's 65. So let's not ever assume that a 90 year old and 85 year old can't communicate with you is beyond them what's going on within their account. So definitely we have to be aware of that. And then also, when we use the word dementia, we tend to use that generally, like, oh, she's got dementia. And honestly, it's that's not the case. Dementia is a symptom of a health issue. So whether they have the disease, Alzheimer's, or they have Lou body disease, Parkinson's, and something as simple as a urinary tract infection can temporarily render you having dementia symptoms. So we have to be really careful when we're addressing situations to know your client and make a proper assessment. There's nothing wrong with asking your client, how are they doing? You know, and expressing the things that you've observed that led you to the concern. Um, so yesterday I saw this happen, two weeks ago this happened. Express the facts of what you've seen that's leading you to have these concerns and have a frank conversation, respectful, but yet frank conversation with your client. Because honestly, when you think about it, a financial advisor is as important as a doctor, the pharmacist, the caregiver. We are instrumental in the aging process with our clients. And so uh, letting them know, hey, I'm on this journey with you. I started in the beginning when we started accumulating assets to get to this retirement place where we are today. I'm going to be on this journey with you continuing on and helping them to see that, that I'm on this journey with you and I value your opinion. I'm, I'm looking here to ensure that your interests are taken up um, and I'm here to help you feel empowered with that. So it's important to know as we're noticing these red flags, to be honest and frank and know that your client respects you. 
You are a valued person in their life. And when they come and meet with you, you're adding value to them because you're part of that community that says, hey, I'm here to support you. I'm the player in the role of your aging life here. So it's really yeah. crucial to ask the key questions, you know, and when you see concerns, address them respectfully um, and be aware that dementia is not an overall picture for everyone who's over 65, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's become, Some of us will age as very you, gracefully. <laughs> yeah, as, as you say, it's become part of the parlance and everybody is different. Uh, I do understand that the brain is a wasting asset after a certain age, and I'm past that age. I know that. Uh, William, um, yeah. you know, it, what Rodney's saying makes a ton of sense. Uh, it's absolutely true, particularly in the advisory world where you're fiduciary to the client, that you do have this relationship of trust that is, you know, not unlike a, a, a lawyer that's been a long time consigliere to the family or whatever it is. So anything to add to the observations Rodney made about, you know, interfacing and detecting and trying to stop problems? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one, I agree with everything Rodney just said. Uh, but two, you know, I think that it cannot be underestimated how important that relationship is. And I can give a really great example. So previously, when I served as a CCO, I had an advisor who had a, um, a married couple as clients. And they said, hey, you know, we're going to go be on vacation in Europe for two weeks. You know, if you try to reach out to us, we probably won't respond in a timely fashion. You know, it's great. Bon voyage. Have a great time. So one week later, the advisor gets an email from those clients saying, oh, you know, we're doing some work on our house. You know, can we withdraw, you know, a certain amount of money? I don't remember the exact amount. And then the advisor was like, hmm, you know, they just told me they were going on vacation for two weeks. But now I'm getting this email one week in saying that they do work in their house. And because of that trusted relationship, because of that ongoing service, we were able to determine that their email account had been taken over and we were able to stop that. Now, again, if they just, you know, if the email just went directly to a broker or, you know, someone else, who knows what would have happened. But since, you know, we had that ongoing relationship with those clients, we knew exactly what they were doing. We were able to stop the transaction. So yeah, I, I don't think it could be underestimated how important that relationship is. Jen, I know you and I have talked about this, and uh, I think I have to give Tara Ambrose credit for this, like the second, so-called second level questions that you ask that can mean the difference. I, I know I've talked to others. Joel Sauer talked about it from Schwab. Um, so can you talk a little bit about those second level questions that you ask that you can kind of define the space so that you know for sure, even if you can't stop the first transaction, you might be able to stop a second or a third or a 10th transaction. Yes. You know, a lot of the advisors, they'll ask me, Jen, how do I know? You know, I, how, you know, what should I be asking? Right. Something doesn't seem right. And really I give them the training of it, it's that feeling you need to listen to your instincts. So those, the questions that are asked, that's kind of key. And this is really where a lot of nuance happens. This is knowing your client and their temperament and say, okay, could someone being coached? Could they, could this person be coached by either a scammer or someone who's even, even a relative? And it's asking additional questions. And I know, Ronnie, you have some of these as well, but it's following up on, okay, what is this intended for? Do you expect to, to make another payment, right? Because typically scammers, they won't stop at the first one. They'll go to the second one. And at that point, it's really, let's set a level line. Can we actually stop it? So they will actually realize, look, they're not making sense. They're not able to give us clear answers. So I would say, try to engage the client. One of my one of my um, advisors, she always says, when someone calls in, they're asking for a bad re a request that they're worried about. Let them know, you know what, Mary? Let me um, check on that. I'm in a meeting right now. Let me just call you back, and I'll be able to help you with the. You know, we can follow up um, at a later time. So nothing is that urgent, especially if they're calling in and saying it is. Stop and pause. So you, as an advisor. Don't let yourself kind of be so consumed 
with just rushing through the transaction, right? Because you're trying to make the client happy. Give yourself a time to pause. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, that's the coin of the realm of a thief is creating a sense of urgency. And sometimes it's done with threats of physical violence. Rodney, maybe I was giving Tara credit where it wasn't due, but I'm almost positive. I heard from her like a question to ask is, do you expect to have another similar transaction like this anytime soon? Correct. And and th- and they'll usually say no, right? Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. at least at least you can confine it to the problem that's right in front of you. You you will know if they come back with a similar request two weeks out that it is not part of an anticipated plan, and you can remind them of that. But what are other kind of second level, you know, inquiries that you think you can make one can make to stop harm? You can ask them what's the purpose and reasoning for this distribution. I see I see you've made one before. So what has changed that you are deciding to take additional funds out of your account? You know, and allow them to elaborate. And if they say, well, I've gotten an investment and say, well, what type of investment? What is it for? And you can always ask additional questions because you are their financial advisor. You're, you, you know, you're involved in their life in a way that no one else is. Um, and they have a plan that says, why is it that you have decided to go contrary to the decision that we've made a year ago, three years ago, or, you know, however long? Is there is there a change in your budget? Has there been some health concerns? Are there some additional fees or expenses that's changing the pattern of spending that I know that you are accustomed to? You can always ask additional questions because you're helping to manage these funds so that it can last them for so they, until they live to be 100, let's just say. <laughs> so, so you can ask these additional questions and you can even say something simple as, you know, who has been in your house lately? You know, who has who is involved with you? Who helps you to do your daily task? Who's who's assisting you with other things? Um, knowing the more you know about your client and the patterns in which that they conduct their lives, the more more fuel that you have and tools you have at your disposal to say, hey, this is not normal. And trust your gut instincts. Because, you know, what we find is that clients will lie to you because these perpetrators, these scammers are feeding them information. Sometimes they'll write down exactly what the client should say to you through an email. So they're reading off what this person has told them to say to you. So understand that, that that can happen, you know, that the clients will not tell you the truth of what's going on. But if you persist in asking more and deeper questions, you know, the purpose, the reasoning, um, the unusualness, how this is contrary to the agreement that you have set with them, how this is going to change the future payments in the, you know, for their life, um, that it will change the way in which they they live daily. Those kind of questions, they're going to either one become super defensive because they realize, oh my goodness, I don't have answers to these questions, um, in which case you could ask them to engage another trusted individual in the conversations with you Yeah. so that you can have a clear conversation about what's going on. Yeah, it's people are g- going to lie. I mean, that's the manipulation is very effective by the, you know, whether, by the way, it could be family that's, you know, manipulating the people, yes. but um and- Go ahead, Jen. Were you well, I was going to say, so I, I think it's important for, for the advisors, for the firms and the staff. And this is this is what you really need to include in your training. Well, that's I was actually going to pivot to training next. That's OK. <laughs> but but well, go ahead. Finish your thought. Yeah. Th- this particular point is, is that you yourself are going to be rattled. So this right. is something you really need to recognize to all of your admin staff. Right. The first thing the client says, I'm going to move my account. No advisor wants to hear that. No admin staff wants to be the person responsible for losing an account. So you guys need to be aware that you need to take a time out. When you have a client calling in to think about those questions, take a research, look at their activity, you need to pause that button because you yourself are compromised. And we actually have an escalation process. Even if I get a call that a person has escalated and it has gotten me rattled, I will get somebody else to get in on the call because I know I, I'm not I'm not able to think clearly in this call. So I'm bringing someone outside my operations manager to come in and handle this difficult call. So, you know, I recommend those extra steps. Uh, one of our uh, attendees uh, volunteered that um, ha- ha- to ask the question, have you been coached? 
has anyone told you not to inform others? I mean, you may as well, you know, yeah. put your you know finger on what you know is going on. And I agree. I mean, the the, the nuance, as you all have pointed out, is wanting to respectfully treat the client understanding that they are in an environment that is unfamiliar to them and stressful uh, and they just want it, you know, I'll say to be over with. But I think that to me, the takeaway here is like, if you, if the approach is that we didn't, we didn't plan for this, right? This was not in the financial model we've constructed to take care of you and yours until you sunset. And hopefully that's a long time from now. If they see that there is a consequence to these transactions that can impact the trajectory of their safety and health in retirement, that I think is a good way to underscore for them and have them, you know, think. I, I also really do like the idea of like not having to take the call immediately. Obviously, there's a balance there. So, you know, there, there are people that have real urgent needs, but whether those real e urgent needs are like minute to minute, it's it's rare. Right. So, you know, if, if if you needed like 30 minutes or even an hour, you know, if, what if you had your own personal emergency, right? It, the system can tolerate it. Right. Uh, let's let's turn to training, Jen. Um, and I know that you have been involved in training uh, others and you do it at your own firm. What's the best way uh, to get through to people? And the thing I point out about training is it's really derived from the conclusions in the bank safe, the AARP bank safe study. And that is not even a ton of time is required to have a substantial difference in the outcomes that people have, you know, an hour or two of training. It doesn't have to be days. It doesn't have to be weeks. So what do you do at your firm to train the people? And I'm assuming you agree with William that it makes sense to train people whether or not they're client facing. So there's a general oh. awareness, right? 100%. Because think about, you know, for advisors, you're reaching out to your clients, but it's often the admin staff. It's often the receptionist that's talking to the clients. Pretty much, you know, they're having personal conversations. So the, the staff members in the back office, sometimes they know the clients really well. So it really needs to be everybody that is going to be everybody in the firm. And that, and that you know, the Senior Safe Act and the presentation that Jerry alluded to um, is an excellent resource. So it's nice to have that put together. But when I talked, you know, William, you mentioned the risk assessment. Mm -hmm. This is when you can bring in personal um, issues at your firm. And refer to certain clients, you know, talk about the advisors and give examples of situations because they likely all will have some of those at one point. And you can really learn from what's happening just within your own firm. And we just, dis we discovered after the risk assessment, that issue that we ourselves are compromised. So that's why we put that second layer and we put in the pause about the transaction. We actually tell people because of cybersecurity, right, and the amount of fraud that's come towards the firm, that we reserve the right to pause transactions and we will require additional time. We're not saying we're not going to do the transaction, but basically we are not going to jump if you call and need $200,000 in an hour. That's not going to happen. Yeah. So we actually put out and build into our system to manage our clients' expectations that we are going through protocols and verification. And that's actually been very well received. Good, good. Yeah. William, uh, anything uh, to add? I, I will note while I'm thinking of it that mm -hmm. after, after we get through June and all the world elder abuse awareness stuff, and there's a lot going on, uh, our committee is going to be turning toward developing an investment advisor, continuing education, qualified module that's based on the Senior Safe Act and has the testing that's required to meet the standards uh, for the continuing education. So look for that to come. Jen, I may ask you to help me with that one, by the way. This is your invitation. <laughs> to have, and, and William, for that matter. But uh, that, that'll be coming uh, sometime in the fall. But William, anything to add? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think, again, everything Jen just mentioned is fantastic. I think that, you know, sometimes as advisors, we get stuck on the regulatory requirement. Oh, of course, we have to train on our compliance program annually. We have to test it annually. But I really think it's it's more that ongoing training. And again, like you said, Rich, it doesn't have to be like a three-hour presentation where everyone's at a big auditorium and just listening to you speak. You can bring in different speakers. You can you know, let even some of the advisors tell their own personal stories. Um, you know, I, you know, even for me, you know, I had a, I had a call from my father that my grandmother called him and asked if I was in jail in Florida. And I was like, well, no, I'm in Maryland. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, you know, I, I think bringing those personal stories can really drive it home. Uh, but also, again, I think pairing the training with technology. So for example, at my firm, I'm in our CRM, our customer relationship management system. We basically had a box you could check. That was just an at-risk client. So just so you know, when you go on your client base, you could say, oh, I need to check on this client maybe you know, uh, bi-weekly instead of monthly or monthly instead of quarterly. So I think really pairing that training with technology is really helpful. But again, I think as much as you can personalize it, you know, hey, you know, I've seen this before. Here's some of the red flags I've seen with, you know, people under arrest or here's how I've seen clients act when they were told you know, basically what to say versus they're actually speaking naturally. And as the advisor, I know we kind of keep going back to this point, but as the advisor, you have that ongoing relationship. You are the boots on the ground. You are the person that's going to notice these things. Oh, you know, Jim and Sally came in today and they just seemed a little bit off to me. You know, they just didn't really seem like themselves. They're very usually outgoing and this time they were a bit reserved. So again, I think that that training is helpful, but again, having that ongoing relationship Pairing the training with the technology, I think, um, you know, can really help out. All right. I also let's... want to add that training ahead, that's Ronde. free and available is contacting your local FBI. What I've done with my team is have FBI agents come and they have a presentation and they share. Cool. Um, I'm always learning new things and they don't charge me anything for it. I've had the inspector general come out Um and do webinars all on Zoom for my team. So just to educate us on the latest types of things that are occurring. Um, you'll find that Adult Protective Services will be willing to do a webinar for you too, for free, um, to help them understand the process, understand what, what happens when a report is made to them, how you can communicate with them. Strengthening your relationship with your community networks is really good because there are avail 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 available to you free opportunities to have these training, to train your team on from experts who know the field. And um, it's a lot more interesting sometimes for, than me standing in front of them, telling them what, what's going to happen. That's great. I love that. Yeah. I'm going to, I just, I'm going to do that. Yeah, they're, they're, and by the way, I mean, yeah. it's, it's true. Of most agencies, most agencies have a sleeve that is public facing investor education or crime prevention, whatever it may be. And the, you know, they're pros. I mean, they've got presentations. They, they know what to cover. I, I'm about to participate in one uh, with FINRA at the end of the month that is designed specifically for law enforcement people to be trained but it's like, who's the trainer? Who's the trained? It, 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 the whole idea is we're creating a web so that things don't fall through that we need to catch and we can make a difference on. So, uh, William, hmm? stopping the bleeding um, is is next on our outline. So we know we've got a problem. You've got a transaction that's suspicious. You you want to make a move. We're in the investment advisory space. And we'll talk at the end about whether, you know, there really is legal cover for investment advisory firms or not, for example, if they don't have a, a law in the state where the client resides that gives them, you know, the, the lane. But what's the construct in the investment advisory world with the stopping of transactions and how, how do you, what are the considerations? Yeah, absolutely, Rich. Yeah, I, I think that, and that goes back to one of the big distinctions of the advisory versus the brokerage world is that advisors typically don't have that authority to lock down transactions and disbursements. Because again, advisors are usually providing advice. You know, you may have some that do have custody of funds, but generally they're going to be working with a clearing firm, working with a custodian. So I think the the first step is always that ongoing monitoring of the accounts. You know, seeing those red flags being able to, um, you know, again, have that technology in place that it pops up, oh, this is, you know, outside of their general risk tolerance or outside of their, you know, investment policy statement. So you can go to that and say, well, you know, this doesn't look exactly right. 
But two, you know, you really need to develop those relationships with your broker, with your custodian, because again, you're the boots on the ground. You know, the custodian, while they have that authority, they might not necessarily know that this is going on. When you contact them, they could be like, oh yeah, you know, we do have that authority because you've informed us, you have a reasonable belief that there is some type of abuse or exploitation going on. So I think one, that really ongoing monitoring, being able to see if something's out of the ordinary, but two, being able to escalate that quickly to your custodian, to your broker, who actually has that authority to put a stop on those disbursements or those transactions. Jen, anything to add here? Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, William, this is really the heart of what investment advisors need to understand. And is that, you know, Rodney has, she's an incredible resource for her firm, right? But most of the advisors, they don't, we don't have that nor do we have necessarily the authority that the broker dealers do. But our, so look at this, look at the custodian of the account, go to your broker dealer. When you say reasonable belief, we are not doctors, we cannot diagnose it, but we have a reasonable belief something's wrong. Document what you have, contact the custodian, because now you are informing them and they're hearing that you have a reasonable belief that there is potential financial exploitation happening or will occur, and that will trigger their own protocols that they have. So that's a very powerful ally that you have um, to work for the client. Yeah, and I would all say, and I'm not speaking for any agency or NASA for that matter, I'm just observing, um, I can't imagine a regulator would, if, if, everything were handled properly, meaning they, they did what they should. They've got trained people at the advisory firm that they've, you know, put their finger on something. There's clearly something there and, and they choose to report it, whether or not some state law gives them the cover to do it. I, I just can't imagine there's going to be a regulator in the country that would be interested in prosecuting some kind of breach of, you know, name it, uh, because they are trying to do what is reasonable, given what's on the ground to save the investor's best interest. I just can't imagine a fact pattern where any regulator would be interested in that kind of case. Um, obviously, bad facts can make bad law, but you know, I think that the pros in the space here do what is necessary and are a, indeed an extension of us as regulators to protect the investors. Rodney, anything to add, my friend? I think um, understand that we are mandated reporters. Most financial institutions are um, to adult protective services, but know that they um, are not going to stop or um, solve your situation for you that you have at hand. Yes, we're going to report it because we're required to do so, but um, you still are going to be left with the bag of to have to do something, you know, to make a decision. How do I continue to service this client in the midst of this situation that I'm in? So having a plan of escalation, like Jen Jennifer was saying earlier, having a plan, okay, when this happened, this is what we as a firm is going to do. You know, have it written down, you know, discuss with everyone on your team so that because it's gonna happen, it's just a matter of time. If you haven't had an elder financial exploit exploitation situation, I'm quite amazed because I think most of us have clients who are over 65. I'd say probably half of your business is over 65 because that's where all the money's at. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're, the, we're the ones that have all the money. All the, all the people over 50 have all the money. So um, if you haven't had it yet, you will soon. But I think it's important to utilize everyone you have. Say you well, made guess, a report oh. to APS. You mm -hmm. should follow up with APS. If it's lots of money, when I say lots of money, anything over 100,000, contact the police. Contact your local FBI. The FBI has a kill chain factor where they can probably put a stop to it if the money is within the United States. So use whatever mechanisms you have. Call your regulator, raise the red flag, do whatever you have to, because you know when these things happen, timeliness is important because once the money's out the country, you can't get it back. So Ronnie, um, we, oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna just, can you clarify for, for the advisors, which jurisdiction? They should call. And that is it based on where the firm is located? Is it based on where the client is located? Because, you know, we say call APS, but it's like, well, which state, which jurisdiction? Could you elaborate it's on that? It's where the client is physically yeah. located. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And from a criminal jurisdiction uh, standpoint, I suppose you could prosecute it from either uh, jurisdiction. But in, <clears throat> pardon me, I think the easier default is think of where the victim resides. William, anything to add here on on this topic before we move on to the next? Yeah, absolutely. Just real quick, uh, Rich, I think it's great what you said, because I think advisors sometimes do have to get past that chilling effect, because I think yeah. sometimes they're wary about reporting or, again, who do I report to? Like Rodney said, you know, maybe I have a list, you know, on our uh, intro uh, site on our, you know, for our firm on our website saying, oh, here's how, how you report or you know, here's the proper escalation procedures. So I think really getting past that chilling effect is again, you know, privacy laws have carve outs for this type of action for fraud yes. for law enforcement. Um, and again, like you said, I don't I don't see the SEC coming in. I don't see any state regulators coming in saying how dare you, you know, you know, work in the best interest of your client. Um, and just, you know, to throw it out there, uh, if anybody wants to support it, I know there's currently a bill right now in the Senate too, that would actually create um, a task force uh, that includes uh, the SEC that would work on these issues. So um, that's definitely something to keep an eye on as well. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, let's talk about, um, you know, banks, people often wonder what can be done? What is the extent, I'll say, and limit of what banks can do to save the day in these fact patterns? Uh, Rodney, I know you and I talked about this, and and you just did put the period at the end of the sentence there before. If you don't, you know, get to this quickly, and the money goes out the country, it is it is not coming back. But there are instances where banks can reverse transactions, but time is of the absolute essence. Right? Yes, yes, it has to be done like within 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 an hour, or within twenty four hours for certain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think banks are in a very challenging situation. I know that um, creating, pausing transactions, you know, we are, we are a means of facilitating commerce and um, moving, you know, allowing people having access to their funds. Um, and like I said before, clients lie to us every day about when they want something done. They're not necessarily going to tell you the truth, what their intentions are with the funds. Um, so I think each individual bank probably has to create their own process and their, and their own policies and how they're going to do that because there isn't any laws there to really protect us. I mean, there's a very small number, 20, 20 states that we know of that says banks are, you know, can pause transaction, can reach out to persons reasonably associated with the customer, but it's limited. It's limited to what we can do. So I think within the fraud departments, you know, when crimes are being committed and they can identify them, then they can take on extra measure of care when these situations. But I think it goes from bank to bank and state to state, depending on how you're going to um, protect your clients and what is going to protect you as an institution when you do these things. It's a risk either way. Yeah, Um the end of the movie here is if if you don't act with greater speed than is typically uh, possible to accomplish, because it does, I mean, 24, 48 hours, and I've heard people say, I've heard an hour, I've heard 24, and I think the absolute limit I've heard is 48 hours. Um, the bank is never going to be able to, you know, unwind the transaction. And so the whole game here is before the money gets to the bank. That's, mm -hmm. that's 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 where the money leaks out is through the banking and crypto. Obviously, now is is the currency of fraud frequently in these fact patterns. Jen? So, I, I will comment on that because we we had a situation where I had to get a hold of the bank very quickly, the custodian, and in that moment, so this is this is for firms. Um, talk with your custodian about what the process is if you send an ACH or submit that request and you realize it's fraud, who do you call? What do you do? And write down yeah. that information. That yeah. should be a hard copy piece of paper yeah. because when you are in that moment, when you submit it and it goes, and then five minutes later, they come in running in and say, wait, it's fraud. 
your fingers will go numb and you will forget everything you knew about where to go and that's who to call. Really, you want really to have good that. advice. You yeah. need a cheat sheet. That's you yeah. don't want yeah. to be navigating who to call when you've got that adrenaline yes. running. No. Yeah, that's really good advice. Yeah. Yeah. I had that happen. It was I missed half of my own birthday party because <laughs> I yeah. said I I I did not leave and we actually were able to recover the funds because I stayed on it. But that was the biggest takeaway is everybody is going to have that in the firm who to well, call it's just like a fire <laughs> drill when we were kids in school right i mean yep. you got to know where to go and when to go so the yep. one of the one of the audience members properly points out and i know we're all believers in this that investment advisory firms should determine whether in their community at either a county or a state level there's either a multidisciplinary team or a coalition that they can join and work with much like to Rodney's point about the education, if you get into a network and if you get familiar with the people and who and what they can and cannot do, again, it's just going to be easier to navigate when the time comes to navigate. And it's going to come for sure. Yeah. So that's um, a great point. And if you don't know if you have a network, if you go into Department of Justice and type in multidisciplinary teams, it'll show you a location, a locator, and then you can find one within your area. That's great, Rodney. I, it's a yeah, great she, resource. She Who would go to the DOJ for that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Rod, Rodney's not scared to lean on law enforcement. Yeah. I am not. Yeah. I am not yeah. and documented in my files. Yeah. Who Absolutely. I spoke with. Absolutely. Was Rodney, as Rodney said too, just another quick point is don't assume anything. Because again, you might have a broker dealer custodian, but you might have a bank custodian and they could be subject to differing regulations. So just don't right. assume that the custodian, oh, well, the custodian will take care of it. Yeah. Again, I think right. this also goes to the point of the trusted contact. Because again, advisors on, right now are not required to have a right. trusted contact. That's just in the, the FINRA regulations, not the advisor regulations. Again, mm -hmm. it's a best practice. Um, you know, one of the ways, you know, I approached it was this is an emergency contact. This is a trusted person that if, you know, for some reason anything happens to you or that I can contact in a, a certain situation. But again, yeah, I think it's as advisors, we just can't assume that someone else is going to take the action. I think we have to be proactive. Yes, because once the money is gone, it's gone. Exactly. One of our listeners makes the good point that, and there is in this space, compassion, fatigue, uh, vicarious trauma by uh, investigators at the state and federal level by employees at the firms. It, it, this can be a bit of a downer, but, you know, you are up against frequently organized crime, trained professionals. Yes. It's an unfair game and time is stacked against you. So, you know, as I, as I say, all I know is it would be worse if we weren't doing what we're doing. So you got to do it. I mean, the outcomes will be the outcomes, but it would be worse if we did not participate as we do, which is about as good a place as any uh, to bring it home here, folks. Is there anything that any of you would like to add before we sign off? I really appreciate you coming on board. Any resources or or anything you'd like to point out that we haven't covered yet? Anybody? Well, I just, I really want to urge people to go to the Serve Our Seniors page, Rich. Um, from an industry perspective, that is the one site that is, has a, a lot of resources. It's it's kind of a great one-stop shop. Um, and also, I do want to give a shout out to the AARP Bank Safe program. Um, we implemented that at our firm. It has a training program for investment professionals, um, and that was a really nice um, our our employees enjoyed that training. Yeah, there are actually two. There are two AARP trainings. There's yeah. the original one, and I think last fall they dropped the Bank Safe for Broker Dealers, which is kind of an ironic name, but it exists. And I have heard that it is useful. William uh, Rodney, any parting thoughts you'd like to share with us? Yeah, uh, just really quickly. Um, I think that as advisors, we should use all the tools at our disposal you know, get the trusted contact in your agreement, have the language in your agreement that you can, you know, at least put disbursements transactions on hold, uh, do the trainings, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth the pound of cure. Um, you know, and I just think that, you know, using all these different tools while advisors, again, different legal framework, don't necessarily have the capacity to do this directly, 
can really be those really kind of a first, almost think of yourself as a first responder. Say, this is my client. This is my relationship. This is who I protect. And again, use all those tools that you have at your disposal. All right, Rodney, uh, you've been stellar. You get the last word here before I give, we give the code again. <laughs> well, I think it's important for people to understand that this is a very challenging situation. It's a lot of heat and emotions. Um, and then once your client realizes that they have been scammed, that's another you know, challenging time for them. So help them to feel empowered that you are on their team. This can happen to anyone that it's not because of their age. I mean, a lot of times it's because they have access to cash. They have more time to talk to scammers than the average person. Um, so help them to understand that it's not because of their age or their or who they are, that this is rampant all over the United States. You know, um, so, and help them to feel empowered. Like, hey, let's gather these facts and give it to the police and give it to the FBI so this doesn't happen to someone else. You know, I'm here on your team with you and we're going to help prevent this from happening again um, to give them a power and, you know, encourage them to see that. Because at the end of the day, you know, one less person that gets involved in the scam, all the better. Absolutely. I can't thank you all enough. Uh, it's been fun doing the run up to this. And uh, you guys certainly hit your marks here today. Thank you. James, can you pull up? I know it's the same code, but just to make sure. There it is, 148597. Uh, on behalf of NASA uh, and our Senior Issues Committee and from me, uh, have a good rest of your day. Take care, everybody.